Welcome back to Tech Talks. I'm your host, Jack Brownwood, and this is a podcast where I speak to some of the brightest and most influential people in the tech industry in the UK. This week, I sit down with Managing Director over at Pratera Ventures, David Foreman. We had a really in-depth chat about the funding disparity between the North and South, what to look for when you're searching for an investor, and what makes an exceptional founder. No VC in the world will change their investment criteria or investment thesis to back your company. They've got LPs who they've told what we're going to invest in. So it's a complete waste of time. Total and utter waste of time. For more information on this episode and Tech Talks, head over to tech-it.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hi, David. Thanks for coming on. Hello. How are we doing? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Great to have you. Branded up. Love it. I am contractually obliged to wear this. Yeah. I've never seen without it. I've got about 10 of them. So that is just me saying that I'm not smelly. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. We believe you. We believe you. Well, look, I always like to start these things. It's quite a philosophical question. But who is David Foreman? Oh, fuck no. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, who is David Foreman? I don't really know. I think I'm still discovering. Like, I think um, I know who I was, uh, and this is like going straight into the deep end on a, on a podcast, but yeah. I genuinely think early doors in my life, I was a bit of an obbo. Right. Okay. Like, so I, I'm pretty sure, I'm a, I think I'm probably a reformed, arrogant wanker. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what, there's no like one event that said, right, that is the moment you stop being a twat mm. and become a, I'm pretty happy with like the person I am today. Yeah. Not so much if I look back, which is, I don't know, that's kind of, I don't know, probably not the answer you're expecting, but like... It's honest though. Yeah, I've definitely got a, I prefer me in the late 30s, early 40s that I am now to the 26 to 32 year old that I, that I was. Right. So so I, I don't know if that's an answer of what I am today, but it's definitely an answer of what I was, I'm not sure was a great thing. But I, I guess in your, the career you're in now, surely, uh, that straightforward kind of straight to the point talking is probably what was needed, right? Yeah, and I think if you, yeah, I think yes, absolutely, straight talking is needed, and absolutely, say what you think, and you know, sometimes you have to have difficult conversations. I think the self promotion and the proving to like, I, I had a need when I was younger of like proving that I'm the smartest person in the room, and I've now realised, a, I'm fucking not, and b, I don't need to be. I used to, you know, I did the sort of traditional, I was like, you know, school, university, did law at Leeds, went into KPMG, then went to investment banking. And I think that kind of sh- shaped you into kind of a bit of, the culture in the business I was in was a bit of like, we are great and we were very good at what we did, but it was definitely a case of work hard, play hard, tell people how smart you are, be the smartest person in the room. It's all about you and your you know, sort of position and then we set up Pratura and you know as a founder you get punched in the face a fair few times and I think you realize that actually it's not about being the smartest person in the room in fact in some respects it's definitively not about that it's about being in rooms with very smart people and being relatable and being sort of I guess someone people trust mm. and I think the punches in the face the growing up the change in life scenario the you know I've got divorced and, and all that sort of stuff has definitely sort of molded me into kind of the person I am today which is yeah I'm 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 okay with it I wouldn't say what I, I wouldn't say I was back in the day wow okay well look and and loads to unpack there and I'm, I'm very excited <laughs> um so sounds like are you a psychologist geez, or is this the remember writing that down and um, no um, well look it all started somewhere yeah. and and as you know tax vision is to create a world where everyone gets their dream job. So I need to ask you to draw something. Right. Unfortunately. Okay. Um, are you a good drawer? No. Drawer is that artist? Artist. I definitely wouldn't call myself an artist. Okay. Well, that you've answered the question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk us through. I guess what you wanted to what you wanted to be. It depends on what age. Okay. So up till the age of sixteen, I had the completely unrealistic view of being a pro- professional footballer. Okay. Um, I was quite good at football, but nowhere near the level needed to be a professional footballer, but that probably didn't change your view of just that's what I want to be, right? Um, And probably at some point I realized that that was an absolute pipe dream, Uh, never going to happen, nowhere near good enough. Like, I'm not even going to give you the stories of I had trials at XYZ that everyone's fucking got, right? Because 
I was nowhere near, nowhere near. So I'm not saying that, but I just wanted to be one, right? And you know, you always think, oh, I don't work really hard and I try hard and I train. I did all of that good stuff. And it was, you know, I was okay at an amateur level and not, not professional level, so that's fine. Um, after that, I kind of always knew somewhere in the back of my mind, I wanted to like be part of setting something up and be a founder, be an entrepreneur, be a whatever the word was back in the 90s when mm. I was kind of, you know, growing up, going through teenage years. Not because my family had done that, not because there was anything in my family that said, oh, you know, we've all had our own business and this is what you do. I just kind of thought that'd be where it was, but I didn't know what that would be in. I definitely wouldn't have said what I'm going to be as a founder of a business that ends up kind of doing financial services and, uh, and venture capital. Mm. Like, I just wouldn't have assumed that. I would have assumed if someone asked me, and again, later in my life, like 20s, I'd have assumed I'd have been on the receiving end of VC checks and trying to build the next Google or Facebook or whatever it might be. I, I think football is easier to draw. Right, I'll draw, I'll draw a footballer. So yeah, you wanted to be a footballer. I'll draw Brilliant. a footballer. I love your ring, I love your uh, wearing ring by the way. Yeah, 15 pound from Amazon. Really? <laughs> wow. I will go into the wedding story because it involves a shotgun wedding in Vegas after my wife got deported. Right, here we go. That's it. That's me. And uh had an arm. Yeah, arms are, I'm really sorry. Really sorry. This is gonna get into this is gonna get into the realms of stick man. Hey, it's cool, yeah, no problem. Right, so that'll be so I've drawn a head and then a stick man. Yep. And then there's the football boot with Added a, added a samba. They were the football boot of choice. Nice, good choice, good choice. What color are we talking? Oh, black, classic. Right, I wasn't good enough to wear colored, colored boots. That's me. Dave, that's incredible. I'll put some hands because I had hands. Yeah, you had hands <laughs> even back then. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, managed to, I, managed, I managed to have hands. Uh, I think I'll do. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And if anyone's looking on the screen, yeah, watch the, watch the video if you are just listening. Um, when did you become so realistic that you weren't going to become a, a football player? I think when you're trying to be a football player, that that punch in the face comes pretty pretty quickly. Because right. do you know what really really surprised me in the world of football? Right, is people who are who are kind of jealous or dismiss the achievement of becoming a professional footballer. Right, right. It is the most meritocratic thing you've ever seen. Right, because it's the most widely played sport. Mm -hmm. It's a global sport. So there is not just, are you the best in your little town? Are you the best in your city? Are you the best in your country? You are, are you the best in the world? So when I see people like moaning about how much footballers get paid, they are the top 0.001% right, of people who play football. Because I think if you're good enough to be a professional footballer, you probably want to be, and therefore you probably do become. So it's like, I always think like, because nobody minds it, how much Tim Cook earns at Apple. Mm. He's the best, he's one of the best top zero, 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 one percent, right? Steve Jobs, um, Sundar at uh, uh, Microsoft, whatever, you know, just like, they're the top few percent or the top percentage of percentage. Football is the same. And I always, I always think like, why do people get so annoyed the fact they get paid so much money? It's like, why wouldn't they get paid this much money? The commercial enterprise of football is so big. And these people are not, do, they're not, they're not, it's not nepotism, is it? It's not, it's nothing to do with favoritism. It's nothing to do with where they came from or their background or their socioeconomic class or what. It's just, are you fucking good at football? Mm -hmm. And if you are, you're really valuable to us. And I've always, it's one of those things, I know, complete tan tangent, but. No, it's interesting. I've always wondered why do we get so obsessed with how much we get paid? Yeah, I know, and I, I get what you mean. I get what you mean, and it's it's a really good way to look at it in the fact that the hours that someone's put into to, to hone that skill it yeah. is now being it, it yeah. is being paid in in lieu. And yeah, and he, like I said, background isn't it's not nep nepotism cronyism. It's more just the fact that, in fact, sometimes a, a bad background can actually help you motivate you to get to a point in which you. Yeah, there's no, mm. there's no. I don't think they've ever done, done like science of it. Like there, there are certain sort of um, areas of the world that don't generally have the sort of fair representation of footballers, but overall, it is very, very, very meritocratic. In a way, comparison. So compare that to film stars. A lot of them are, you know, parents.
clients are in have done it they you know they've become into it it's hard to break into that that creative industry but favoritism definitely helped knowing people definitely helped so i've got much more like why should actor abc or actress xyz earn what they earn because actually i think that the bar is probably lower mm. there are more people who could do an okay job doing that acting in that role in that film than there are people like you put footballers versus actors so you put a slightly lower standard footballer in the premier league they're gonna stand out like a sore thumb mm. you put like a t of b actor in a a-list movie mm. They probably just look like a, they just probably look like an actor in a movie, right? It doesn't, you know. And then I just think it's an interesting, it's an interesting debate. I've always thought like, the, if you're the very best at what you do, money will flow. And it's going to start messing with the question after the conversation we just had. Are you passionate about money? Uh, no, but um, I'm passionate about creating an environment where people in my organization, people who are shareholders in the business, my business partners and I can create opportunities for ourselves and that we can execute on, right? I want to make myself and my family comfortable. I want to be able to provide for myself, my wife, hopefully a family down the line. And I want to be able to enjoy some sort of like retirement, right? I want to do all those things which will mean I probably don't want to go like chase the dream forever and be one of those people who's still chasing it at 80 because mm. that's probably not me. But there's definitely an element of, I want that security. Um, I want to, I want something to almost make the journey of being a founder of a business, which is very, very hard and you sacrifice a lot, mm. worth it. And you get worth out of like, you know, seeing your team develop and seeing people in your in your business or seeing founders that will back flourish and develop and get what they want out of life. That's one part of it. And then one part of it is the professional satisfaction of building something good that has a that lasts way beyond me. Yeah. And then part of it is the money side of it, which you'd hope is commensurate with the work and the effort you put in. But I don't need hundreds of millions of pounds. I'm not aiming for that. That is not the realistic goal. But I, you know, I want to be comfortable and be able to provide for my family. Where, where did you grow up and what were you like as a kid? I grew up in uh, just outside Manchester in Wilmslow. My parents are from London, hence the kind of crossover accent that I've got. Um, I went to school in Wilmslow and then in Stockport. Uh, and I was a kid who was a little bit cheeky, but worked really hard. Like my brother, interestingly, is way smarter than I am. Way, 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 like my brother in some respects is intimidatingly smart, mm. but he didn't work very hard. Mm. And I think actually he spent a lot of time trying not to work hard because I think he didn't like being so smart. Right. I'm nowhere near as smart, but I work very hard. Mm. Um, and so I was kind of the person who would, I wouldn't say I was a geek, but I made sure I'd worked hard and got what I needed to do from from grace and that which which was ultimately just down to doing the work I didn't have a natural ability to be like oh yeah that's fine I don't need, you know so, you know some people at school like they don't need to do work they don't need to do anything they don't need to and they're just fine um and then as I got older I got better at playing the system of education you know and I got my law degree by working out what the questions were going to be and <laughs> learning those topics and those topics only and if I'd have got that wrong i probably would have struggled because i didn't know a lot <laughs> yeah if you're if you're that clever like your brother um is is, is there ever an element of like oh, i don't need to work that hard mate. i think there is yeah. i think there is and also i think especially in the 80s when uh, 80s early 90s i'm not sure it was cool to be mm. like super smart sure so i think there was an element of i just i think he sort of downplayed a little bit yeah tempered it a little bit with tempered a little bit huh interesting because so, so, I didn't have that problem because there wasn't that much to temper. <laughs> sure, yeah. So how did you, so how did you go from that cheeky but hardworking kid uh, to to now? Uh, well, it's setting up a Pratura. Um, also, where did the name come from? <laughs> the name came from my. So there was three of us who co-founded the business: uh, Mike, Padder, and myself. 
And I was sat there at like the beginning of the day, early days, um, and you've got that list of company names on a piece of paper, and I had about 50, and I knew they were all shit. <laughs> like, I knew they were all dread. Like, very derivative, very, like, obvious, you know, like, some word and then capital, and it's just like, you look, I, I don't have it now, I wish I did, but I know they were dreadful. Mm. Mike just said, I think we should call it Prychora. I'm like, okay no idea what that means what why do you think it means and he came up with this story and he quite like classics i think and he was like so praetor and guard they looked after caesar and and all that sort of stuff and it's like okay well that sounds all right um we'd been in investment banking and code names for projects generally were lat like were latin and things like that so okay, we were in that sort of phase of our lives right it's a bullshit phase but that's <laughs> so he, he came up with this story and i was like okay that's fine and I was just pleased that someone said they wanted, that Mike said he wanted to call it something because it meant I could throw my piece of paper away and it never saw the light of day. Later on, you realize that A, the Praetorian Guard can't be that good because Caesar got stabbed in the back. <laughs> yeah, good point. So not a great start. <laughs> yeah. And B, we spelt it wrong. <laughs> so you're joking. It should have a no. <laughs> so it's not that but what i will say is do you realize just how hard it is to name companies yeah really hard and i think you're better off just having a name mm. and it is what it is i think one of the really sort of thing that i kind of find funny about Prajo is nobody knows how to say it mm. and weirdly if someone says to me how do you say it if i start thinking about it i actually don't know how i say it yeah so you could be prey or pry mm. you could be torah or chora mm. or torah um, so there's like probably five or six ways of saying it. I think everyone says it differently. And the one good thing is very unlikely to be a problem on Google search words. True. Yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> very unlikely to find someone else who had the same inspiration and spelt it wrong in the exact same way. Good point. I think the fact that people are just thinking about how to pronounce it is probably a good, it's a good, it's a good issue to have, right? Yeah, it's not great for my other co-founder, Pada, whose name is Pada, so Irish, P-E-A-D-A-R. Pada at Prychora is a tough email to spell. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Fair enough. I'm surprised he didn't just completely veto it. But, yeah. you know, we're early. It was just nice that someone said they wanted to, they had a name and we were like, fine, cool. that yeah. will do. Yeah. Yeah. Our first logo was horrendous. We, mate, we've just been through a rebrand. We, we hate it because we were so excited to get going. And we did the whole, like you said, name any company thing. We, we thought of all the Latin words, and but how can you pronounce them slightly different and all that yeah. sort of thing. Or can you just take a word, drop the vowels and call it something cool and be a tech business? Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so, surprised you're not just TCT. We, we, we thought about it, thought about <laughs> it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, yeah, it's, uh, it may, it's, it's so tough, but. It's really hard. Yeah. Because then you get like, the other thing is you get to the point you're like, oh, that's quite good. And then you Google it and there's eight of them. Yeah. Right, and you're like, well, I, I can't do that. It's really hard. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really cool. hard. Uh, but the first logo we had was like black and gold, and like a Roman helmet with the plumes. Okay. Like yeah. The full-on plumes. Um, truly, truly, truly dreadful. I think every now and again, I kind of find find it and just send it around our team just to remind them. So just to remind you come. How, well, not how far we come, just how shit we were. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you could, surely got still got some merch from back in the day. Do you know, I don't think we really went down the merch route. I think we might have known how bad the logo was. Like deep subconscious level of, I know this is dreadful, I can't do it. So we went through a rebrand when we sort of, I guess, launched what I call sort of Prachura sort of version two in sort of 2018, 2019. And that's the that's the branding we have now. Well, you talked about this list you had that you, that you were calling through i assume and um how do you how do you get to that point Why, where did the because it's very rare that someone just goes right we're going to start uh, so interestingly so i was at the investment bank and i uh, so this is altium so now houlihan luke lukey uh, as they've rebranded several times and been acquired recently um so gca altium and i was there and the bread and butter of what we did was private equity so working with likes of ldc and north edge and you know, private equity transactions and ipos and for whatever reason in the Manchester office, we started doing some work with like earlier stage businesses, entrepreneurs. And we worked on, we raised the first sort of institutional capital for the Hook Group. 
Whoa, okay. So the first six million the Hut Group raised in 2010. So I was on the deal team that worked on, on that. So I met Matt Boulding and we sort of did, did all that. Um, I then, we then won the mandate for AO and failed to raise money for AO in 2010. Pretty bad decision by people, given it went on to float for like one point something billion. But you know, uh, and and I th I look at these as like London buses, and I'm sure there was more time between. And then we won the mandate for my protein, so to raise capital for my protein, which eventually got bought by the hub. And in that sort of three company sort of span, I was I was exposed to earlier stage stuff, incredible entrepreneurs. So John Robertson, Steve Corns at AO, Matt Molding at the hurt, John Gallimore at the hurt, uh, Oliver Cookson at my protein. I just kind of fell in love with it. Like I just that would to me was a lot more interesting than even though they were smaller and they were sort of a bit more scrappy and less established and didn't make as much money as like the bigger companies I've been working with. But there was something about it that I just got excited about. And also, you realize that finding money for those businesses was really hard and you kind of were doing it. So we were raising money for the Hook Group and we went everywhere. We went to London, we went to America, we went to Europe. Where we didn't go was Manchester. And yeah, for AO, we could barely get meetings, right? So I just kind of, I guess we kind of realized that nobody's funding these businesses in this space. Manchester's got an absolutely thriving private equity community, but venture, early stage stuff, businesses that aren't making 5 million profit and you know, planning to make 10, mm. nobody was funding them. So we just like, right, well, why don't we do that? Um, so we left our jobs and we set up and we had a network of sort of some high net worth of people we'd potentially sold businesses before. And a lot of them weren't necessarily my relationships. So I don't I say no credit for it, but we just said, well, why don't we see if we can back the next generation of them? And that was 2011. And here we are in 2023 still trying to do that. We're a bit bigger now. We've got a bigger portfolio and, and we've got more founded a number of businesses along the way. We've got um, across the group now, we're 150 people. We're 530 million of our assets under management or lending book. Sort of in the region of, I think this year, the plan is to do about 50 million of revenue. Um, so it's come a long way, but ultimately the bit that I was really passionate about was finding and backing that next generation of great businesses, great founders, great entrepreneurs, particularly in this region. Um, and that's that's the journey. And then sort of, you know, 20, 2018, we kind of got to a point where we're like, right, well, there's a crossroads here. We've got a, a, we've got stakes in some businesses. You know, on a good day, that could be enough money. And on a bad day, that might not be enough. Um, but we wanted to create something a bit more lasting, a bit more legacy. So we sort of took some capital in, put everything under one roof, under Pratura Group. And I set off to run and sort of start Pratura Ventures in a more structured way. So historically, we raised, we found a deal, we raised money from high net worth on a deal by deal basis. And we set off to raise funds and be able to sort of raise funds before we've done the deal. And since 2019, we've raised about 100 in ventures. We've raised about 145 million pounds. We've got a portfolio of 33 companies now, the majority of which are in the north of England, um, in tech and health. And you know, we've we started to make a bit of a difference. That's incredible, An amazing story. And um, yeah, I think is that changed now? Is there is there less of a gap in the market for for people trying to raise that sort of money? Uh, I think less, but still a massive gap. Right. Yeah. So when you say there's less gap, you're starting from the most big, the, the most ginormous gap you've ever thought of. Right. Oh. So let me just give you some amazing stats. The North is about 20% of every economic measure you can put in the UK. So mm. population, active companies, GDP. Yeah. London is about the same. Right. Okay. In VC, 80% of VCs live and work in London. 3% of VCs live and work in the North of England. If you apply the amount of VC capital that goes into London-based founders on a sort of per capita, per company basis, and said that same amount should happen in the North, there'd be 9 billion more funding, venture capital funding for founders in the North of England than there is today. It's yeah. just a ginormous gap. 
because whilst Zoom and Teams has cha changed the way people live and yeah, you can you can do more stuff remotely right now, but at early stage in a company, VC is quite a local game. I mean, it's quite you want to be able to sit across the table from people. I know you've you've spoken to some of the founders in our in our portfolio. You want to be able to sit across from the likes of Safe at Arctic Shores and have a conversation about their business and their dreams and their hopes and what's good and bad about the business. And that is a very different conversation on Teams than it is on face to face. Yeah. And then when the inevitable sort of troubles and you know not sure about this because the one thing about founders is I don't realize this pretty from doing being myself is a lot of time you don't know what you're doing right and you spend a lot of time trying to convince everyone that you do but actually you don't those conversations are so much easier face to face mm. so it's quite a local business so that gap is better there are more funders today than there were in 2010 and there are more funders in 2023 than there were in 2020 yeah. but nowhere near enough you know and and Manchester in particular, but Leeds and you know Liverpool to a certain extent, the North generally is trying to build this startup ecosystem. I think everyone realizes the importance and power of startups in any particular region. It's what makes it's part of what makes a city vibrant and makes a city great, right? It's young people, it's building stuff, it's exciting, it's success stories, it's just I like I just love startups. And therefore I'm probably biased in that view. But but I guess the point is you kind of there's more but there's not enough mm. and if we want to try and you know everyone talks about leveling up and everyone talks about kind of you know how do we get the how do we get the northern powerhouse to really work a lot of it's around the startup community and to have the startup community you need founders you need people working around those founders you need advisors you need you know all of the things that kind of go around the startup community we've all been to events on and you know Things like tax, right? And then you need funders, and we need success stories, and we need the funds to have massive success from backing the next version of Matt Molding, or the next version of John and Steve at AO, or the next version of Bet365 in, in Stoke, or the next version of Pets at Home. You know, that's what we need, and because out of that will come more success and more people confident enough to say, fuck it, I'll start something, and they might start something consequential for the world. You know, PKI in Manchester. We backed them when there were four or five people in, you know, in an office with an idea and now they're, you know, a they're becoming globally consequential. You know, they've got offices in India, they've got offices in America. They've got 300, 400 people working for them. You know, they've been backed by one of the biggest VC, VCs in the world, SoftBank. Like they're becoming part of it. You know, Matillion, um, Matthew Scully and uh, Matillion is building something really consequential and to do that you need it all to happen you need funding you need founders you need the ecosystem you need the support you need a bit of luck you need the confidence to do it um you need the talent to be here and that all happens it's not one thing that's most important but it all needs to grow together i'm fired up <clears throat> you got me fired that, that was fantastic yeah um look and, and I, I read your because you created a not a white paper. Well, I white think it paper, started yeah. as a white paper, but it started, it became a labour of love, right? Yeah, <laughs> it but basically got bigger a book. than we thought. Yeah, and I, and I went through it, and I was I was getting a little bit angry a lot because I'm, I'm 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 from Manchester originally, and um, looking at some of the stats in there was ridiculous. I think it was fifty percent of funding goes well, almost fifty percent of funding goes to just London. Yeah, um, out of the whole. I think it's, I think it's slightly more, more Jeez. than fifty percent. But, which but, is it, crazy. but it will when you think 80% of VCs are in London. <laughs> Makes, yeah, I get that. But, but then it, it seems like Manchester is a logical option, although, because there was another infographic in there, which, which fun, it's been a fantastic, whoever's, whoever's uh, listening to this, download it because it's brilliant. There was an infographic on it where it was compared to different variables from uh, the, uh, the uh, North and London. Um, and we were beating them on everything apart from two things, which was uh, affordable office space and um, oh, what was the other one? Remote talent. Yeah. They were the two. They were the two elements. Um, do you th have you seen that kind of as as a as a as an issue for people coming to Manchester? Joe, you know what today? And the and the and the you know the market report we've done is is a fantastic. Way work. We got contribution from three hundred contributors on that. Wow. On that on that sort of work, and it became bigger and it got bigger and bigger. Manchester today is far better than it was five years ago and it's far better than it was 10 years ago across across pretty much every metric 
um, and also just feel, right? You know, people come to the city and it feels vibrant now. And I'm not sure it did 10 years ago. But I just think, you know, it's a great place to build a business. And there are, there are less impediments today about building a world-class, you know, consequential business that can compete globally in Manchester. I'm not sure you could say the same 10 years ago, which is a great, which is a great start. But, you know, and I do think there is something, I'm very passionate about Manchester. It's where I've done all my work. Um, I'm actually a Liverpool fan, so that, that probably, yeah. I don't quite know how that happened and let's not dive into that. Um, but but I am very passionate about Manchester and I think there is something, um, it's almost like there's this slight chip on our shoulder about not being London, but we're big enough for it, for, for, for the benefits of a city to kind of exist. And there is a bit of what I love about Manchester right now, and I think the greatest thing about Manchester is there's no impediment, there's no real impediments, and it is cheaper to live here, and it is cheaper to have office space, and it is, and it is all that. But I, f- I feel like in London, it's still it's very doggy dog. Like people actually quite like the failures. Yeah, and it's like don't look at them and their success because look at me and look at my success, right? Whereas I feel in Manchester when people are successful, people want them to be successful. People want to celebrate them more than perhaps they do in London. You know, people want to, I think everyone's rooting for there to be that breakout business from from Manchester. There is, people want it to happen because they know that the cascading down effects are there, are there and we've not necessarily had it. You know, we've had some great successes, but even then, like, THG and the whole like listing and what's happened post listing is it's a little bit disappointing because it is a fantastic business. Whether it was worth six billion that we floated for is a totally different question. But I think as a as a region we would have all benefited from that being a super success. Why was it disappointing afterwards? I don't think I'm cleared up on that. I mean the share prices have gone from like five pound at float to like fifty p. Uh, like. So, and, and that happens to a lot of tech stocks, but THG is very much in the news. Um, and I think the region, would it would have been great for the region for that to really flow. Mm. You know, um, same as like Boohoo, you know, share, lots of businesses' share price have gone down, but I think we're, we're crying out for the success stories. I don't think everyone wants the success story to happen. You say that's a usual thing. Is it because it gets so hyped up before the listing then? Possibly. Right. Possibly. Um, and I think there was, I mean, it's an entirely different podcast and an entirely yeah. different debate on, 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 on the story of THG. But you do know that it's an incredibly, you know, incredible entrepreneurial story from where it began to where it is now. It's a massive part of like the, the tech scene in Manchester. And what happens with these great success stories is an incredible talent that leaves and goes off and sets their own thing up, right? Because sure. they've learned from someone brilliant or a team that's brilliant or massive success, right? So there's a huge positive, net positive from, from THG within this industry. We, it just would have been better if the, the end result post float sort of matched the bit before float. Of course, passionate about Manchester, which you can clearly tell. I think it was something you were talking about there and we're talking about, we've had people from your portfolio on the podcast before, uh, the founders, incredible people, obviously. Uh, it sounds like you're passionate about meeting these, these incredible founders. I guess, and you've, I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times. What makes what makes an amazing founder? I think answering this in two different ways. So first thing is, well, like VC is all about, and I think VC gets VC's got a lot of airtime recently, and a lot of it's overcomplicated, right? We're looking for find exceptional founders, help them build the best business they can. Really simple mission. When you actually boil it down, that's what VC should be doing. So then you say, well, what makes an exceptional founder? And I think. Some people just have it and you meet it and you know it. And you you're just like five minutes in, you're like, yep, yep. I'm really like, you get that kind of feeling of like, just shut up and let me give you my money, right? You know, just that thing. You don't know what it is. It's an X factor. It's a, it's a thing. And you've, I've met people like, you know, Matt Moulding definitely had it. Yeah, he's probably one of the reasons why I'm doing this. John Roberts, Steve Corns at AO. Very lucky now, Steve Corns is actually chairman of Pritchard Ventures, so I like my mentor, so a bit of a, you know, sort of go full circle, but, you know, great, great founders have it. Sometimes it's, but then, you know, if you don't get that initial, like, that's it, I just don't know what it is, but that's it, 
you start to build up what it is. And I think the big thing is a belief that they will achieve what they're setting out to achieve. Probably won't look exactly the way they've set it out in their plan and their deck and all that sort of stuff. And it's not a linear path to success, but it's a belief that they will have, they will be able to ride out the bad bits and achieve the good bits, right? I also am looking for kind of unique insight. So one of the questions I, I love being sort of, you know, when you meet a founder and they kind of just, they can explain, and whether they answer it the question or whether they just like over the course of a meeting explain it is, why us, why now? So why are we as a group of people together in this company, are we as a group of founders, what gives us an unfair advantage, right? You know, so what gives us the insight into the market that says that is a pain point that people are pre- that tons of people or tons of companies are prepared to pay us to fix, you know, and that insight could generally comes from sort of being in the market. I'd prefer people who've been in the market and experienced the pain first time than like a consultant type approach of we think there is this problem in the market because real life lived experience is I think is better than textbook level thinking. Um, And then why now is kind of, why are we the right people? Why have we got that unique insight? Why, Why is whatever we're doing, whatever goal we're trying to achieve, why, why now? Why, why does the world need us? And why do you need to give us money right now to capitalize on that opportunity? Uh, and, and the best founders answer that really well. And they might answer it in a direct, here's why, or they just, they just give you that sense of, you know, you come away from a really good founder meeting. I come away like buzzing, finding ways of trying to do with it. You almost become the positive version of like, well, what could happen if they're right? Versus the, let me think about all the things that might not be true about this. And you ask the, ask one of those dumb questions that VCs asked, like, what happens if Google build this? And it's like, well, yeah, but Google can build anything, right? So if you don't do something that Google do, or if there's a big player in the market, what will, I don't know, think of a big company Microsoft do if you're if you're building something like what Microsoft what would Microsoft do and it's like well if you if you applied that logic nothing would ever get built because there's always a big player that you're trying to take market share from right and if you just assume a big player can do what they want then you'd never back anything so you almost have to have that positive mindset of what could happen if this went well that is a very long-winded way of saying you know, some founders, you just get the feeling about it. And some founders just build up that layer of proof point, proof point, proof point of saying they're highly competent. They know what they're doing. They're good. You can see they're good leaders and, and they and they have that unique insight that you go, that is an unfair advantage. That question you mentioned before, the, um, what, it, you know, what itch you scratching and, uh, and, and why do you now need the, need, need our money? Yeah. Um, do you think the, the, the positive meetings that you have uh, answer that question so well. Is that because they, this is that, that like we, we we don't particularly want funding, but we just we need it to be able to get to get our business to the next level. Like it's the last port of call for them. It's like, yeah, I need we need funding. Yeah, do you know what? Some founders have become professional fundraisers. Okay. You know, and like they're great at raising funding. They're great at telling the story. They're great at convincing people to give them capital and perhaps not as great at just doing the doing. I very much love the founders who are like, I've got this fundraise, but something I need to do because I need this for that and I need that for that and I need that for that. I want to get this done and I want to get back to running my, back to running my business. I think some people like the intellectual you know, stimulation of raising money because it's like you go and speak to people, you talk about the business, it's all, it's all like, it can be something that people like, see valid see validation from getting money from VCs like that validates the business raising money from VCs is 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 a thing that you might need and by the way just so anyone listening like lots of companies don't need VCs and if you can bootstrap great if you can raise it from somewhere else great like VC is not the answer for the business but some people see that if you you know and you see it on social media like a huge fanfare about a fundra- fundraising round and yeah, you should celebrate because it's hard. It's hard to raise a lot of money from people. But 
that's not the thing we should be celebrating. We should be celebrating what can be achieved or the milestones that have been hit, the you know, the zero to one million AR, the one million to ten million AR, the the opening of the office in in America and actually getting American clients or European clients or whatever it is. Like the milestones in the business rather than the milestone of great news, we've raised some money. Like raising money is just fuel for the fire to allow you to achieve what you want to achieve. I've actually forgotten the question. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, what you were saying there is a really, really great insight. Like, I, I love that, the fact that someone's like, yeah, can we just have your money now? So I want to get back to work. Yeah, yeah, just want to get back to, just yeah. want to get back to work. Like people do. But some, I think, really like the fundraising process. Yeah. And do you, is there an argument to say that if you had both of those sorts of people, it would be kind of the perfect combination, really? There are certain businesses where fundraising is an important skill. Right. And, I'm, you know, so therefore it would be good to have someone who can tell our story. And equally, fundraising is, to a certain extent, the same as selling, right? You know, the skills are the same. You go out to a potential pool of people who might want to give you some money and you're selling a part of your company. You're selling a dream. Think about selling a product. You're going out to a pool of people who might potentially be interested in buying a product and you're selling a product and people will give you money in exchange for that product, whatever it might be. If you can fundraise well, it means you're probably a quite good storyteller. If you're a quite good storyteller, you probably can sell your product to people because ultimately it's the same skill. You're trying to, we have the pain point we're fixing for a VC is we have money to deploy. We want to back the very best founders in either the Northwest or in tech or in AI or whatever it might, whatever your investment thesis is. You're solving the pain point by being a great founder with a great business that we can back and, and be part of it. So, I do think that great, fundra great fundraisers can also be great, are often great salespeople and therefore, and given sales is one of the hardest thing to do in, in, in business, right? Selling, getting people to buy your product, exchange their money for your product. Being a great fundraiser is a good trait. How many pitches have you been through, do you think? Oh, fuck no. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, who knows? Thousands? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, Put it into a different context and this isn't all me right so sure. this is business-wide now we probably see over 200 opportunities a month wow okay um we were asked last year for over three and a half billion of funding um which we sifted down we invested 27 million quid last year jeez so it's a lot yeah it's yeah, a yeah. bit uh, and to be fair within that there will be the ones that are asking for 10 million pounds for a no, an Indian business that we are physically unable to invest in. We invest in UK companies only. So like you can cut that out straight away. Yeah. Right? So there was some in there that's just an immediate, well, we can't do it. Whether we like it, whether we don't like it, we can't do it. But then you cut it down from 200 to maybe 50 that we look at. And that's across, my, that's across the team. And out of that 50, well, 200... 3% make it to what we call sightings, which is the very first stage of our investment committee. So that's six a month. And to get to sightings, there's been work, there's been conversations, there's been multiple chats, there's been market validation, there's been work going on, which is a lot of work. Like, and then out of that six, we probably fund new businesses one a month. Right. So 200 down to one. So you know your numbers then. You know, you know what you need to, you need to be going. It's a bit of a numbers game. Yeah. And it's not a direct correlation between like, well, if we got 400, we'll be there for our better opportunities. But having 200 is way better than having only 20. Mm. Like, so I'm not sure it's a linear thing that 400 is better than 200 particularly, but you can't do it with a very small deal flow because you're, tr you, you know, you need to see everything. Like the big thing I check, one of the big things I check and we obviously have other funds in Manchester and if there's a business that we, that has raised money and there was one actually yesterday, it was in the Times, looks quite an interesting business, right? And Northern Gritstone have backed it and um, I think I can't remember else. Looks really interesting. Looks like a good deal. Might be a good deal. I don't care that we've not done it, but if we hadn't seen it, I'd be really pissed off. Like, so we, and we had, and that's fine. And for whatever reason, we, it wasn't one we absolutely went after. We won't know until down the line whether that was a good decision by us or a good decision by Norman Gritstone, or it's just maybe not even a decision. Maybe it's just a chemistry thing, right? It's just they might have had a better 
cents from, from another funder. Whatever it is, I don't care whether we've not done it. I care that we've seen it. Because then at least we are in the, we're in the race. Yeah. If that business is the best thing that we could invest in, you know, in, in, in the current moment, I need to, we need to have seen it. We need to, which is where the numbers come in. Because if you've, if you've got a big pipeline and people know us and, you know, especially Northern founders, right? I'd be really disappointed if people don't come to us, at least to have the conversation. Because if you're going out to raise money, you generally go and speak to a number of VCs. You don't go to just one, you go to a number. So the numbers are the numbers are interesting, but it's more about what's our hit rate of. And I will do this, and I'm really annoying to my team. I right? just send them a like, send them a message, like, seeing the article. Did we see this? Like, and usually the answer is yes, and that's okay, because we, we won't know whether that's a great business, not a great business, until down the line. It may be it fits someone else's criteria better. It may be that they, the founders, got a much better connection with the other funder. That's fine. We've got to have seen it. You've, again, sat through hundreds of thousands of these things, probably, apparently people who are going out and going to be experiencing these pitches soon. What is the best thing that you can do and the worst thing that you can do in an investment pitch? The best thing you can do is prep. Okay. Uh, so there's, and there's tons of people, <laughs> so many influencers online now that will tell you how to do the pitch, right? But the best thing you do is prep. Go to people like us who fund businesses that look like yours. So many people like scattered on it, right? They're, they're building something or they're at this stage, right? And I'll give you the great, the, the simplest example. If you're raising 50 grand or 100 grand, you don't go to Sequoia, right? Because they don't do that, right? They're not gonna give you 50 grand or 100 grand. If you're gonna try and raise 20 million, don't go to Pratura. We only invested 27 million last year in 13 or 14 new companies. So go to people who are likely to, to back. It's like, it's like, again, go back to that story I talked about, about selling, right? You don't go to every customer. You go to people who are your, you know, your archetype customer. Go to your archetype VC. So the first thing is find people who back people who, and companies that look like yours and go to them first. Because if it's not them, no, I think the big thing that people don't understand is, right, no VC in the world will change their investment criteria or investment thesis to back your company. Never. It will just never happen. Because they've got LPs who they've told what we're going to invest in. Right. So it's a complete waste of time. Total and utter waste of time. Do not do it. Nobody will ever do it. It's just, it's not worth it. And actually, one thing that we're, out of those 200 meetings, going back to it, that we do a month, one of the things I say to the team is, if it doesn't fit our investment criteria, we don't meet them. Because what's the, the worst thing you can do is meet them and really like them. Now you've got this problem. Now you've got the, I really like that, but it doesn't fit our investment criteria, which means you either waste yours and their time because you're not going to do it, or worse, you start lying to yourself about why it might fit your criteria. If you squint a bit and it, it, it might fit, like, it just won't. Yeah. Like no VC will ever change their criteria to work with any founder, no matter what it is. It's just not worth it. Um, so that's the first thing: prep and go to the right people. Then in your pitch, you know, cover all the basics, right? Make the pitch look nice. Generally, if you're shit at PowerPoint or or, or like Google Slides or whatever it is, pay someone to help you. Send with it to Fiverr. Just like because. That, yeah. You know, when I was at the, when I was at the investment, bank, I'm pretty sure I made my life, made my career a little bit out of making things look pretty, because I quite like it and I'm a bit anal on it. And it's just like if you present something well, you get a warmer feeling when you talk about. It. And then the most morning when you're in your pitch and you've got to the point of pitching to the VC or whatever, be you, be authentic, be whoever you are, and have your dream. Right? Don't whatever you do, tell the story that your mate told to raise some money from a different VC or some influencer has said, what you need to do is this, and then you like bend yourself out of shape to try and fit a mold. Because we're looking for authenticity. We're looking for like belief in a person. You can never really, but you can never believe in someone who's being inauthentic or trying to play a role, right? Because they will slip. <clears throat> like if you're, if someone said to you, right, you need to be, I don't know, a certain type or present in a certain way, if that's not you, you will slip. Yeah. 
Because you will. Because this is a long-term thing, right? We don't, you don't pitch, it's not like Dragon's Den, right? You don't pitch and then suddenly the money lands in your account. Like, that's just not how it works. It's a process. We, you know, we spend a lot of time with people and you find out who people are as real people. So be real. Uh, and then think about, again, pain point. What are you solving? Like, we're looking to back exceptional founders, predominantly in the north of England, and then help them build the best of the scam. That's what we want to do. That's our mission. So try and help us understand that why you're an exceptional founder, what your unique insight is, and then come back to that same question I said before, why us, why now, right? Because the worst thing that a founder can get out of the fundraising process when they need money is kind of like, we really like you, but why don't we come back in six months? Mm. Just prove us a few, prove a few more things for us, right? That's such a disappointing answer for founders because it's kind of a non-answer. And, and it's something VCs do, and I'm not sure it's a great thing, but you're kind of getting a free option, right? If it goes well in the next six months, great, we can re-pick re up the conversation. If it doesn't go well, great, we made a good decision not to, not to invest. So you need to kind of get that urgency, a little bit of FOMO, a little bit of, this is your chance to invest, and if you don't take it now, then we'll go and take, it, take some capital from you tomorrow. And I know that's kind of, yeah, I just, I just think that's just what you want to achieve, right? You want to achieve a real desire and you can, and just so people who are listening going through this, right? You can always tell if a VC is interested. I promise you, if a VC waits a couple of weeks, three weeks, and then suddenly goes, oh, I'm really sorry, I've been really busy. Like, you're not top of their pile. And we talk about this with the, with the team, like one of the things we're trying to do this year bet better is like, when we love it, let's drop everything else. Mm -hmm dive in, spend a week with them, really understand this so you can get to a decision really quick. Not, oh, well, okay, we met it and we met it in December and then we've had a meeting in mid-January and then we'll set up a follow-up call for mid-Feb. Like, it's a terrible process for a founder. Like, they want to get it done. But it's really, it's really easy for us to do that because founders will accept it. And we have to hold ourselves to a standard to say that's not the way we want to operate. We want to operate with we like it, we'll throw ourselves at it. Go all in. Doesn't mean you definitely do the deal, right? Because you find out more as you you find out more as you talk to people more and you look at the data and you look at the stuff. But we should be getting to that decision quicker. And I think every VC should be trying to do that. Some like the optionality. That's which is a rubbish which is just <laughs> a rubbish place for VC for a founder to be. Yeah. Right? Sure. Just like, I don't know if these people like me or not. I don't know if they're gonna fund me or not. They're not saying no, so I'll assume that's a yes. But I don't think you can assume that. Actions speak louder. If VCs jump on it and are like, right, when can we speak to this? Can you set us up to speak to this customer? Can we have a look at your mod? And they're in and they're working. Yes. You're in the hunt. If you're kind of feeling people aren't really working on it, you're not, you're not in the, you're probably not. And actually, you know, it's one of the things that Certainly we're trying to be like more ruthless with pipeline. Don't keep things just bubbling along because it's not fair on the founders. It doesn't, it's not great for us. If you've not, I, one, of the, one of the questions I ask the team a lot is, do you love it? Right, do you love it? Do you love this company? Do you love this founder? Do you love what they're trying to do? Are you really bought in? If you are, let's go, help, let's go at it like crazy. If you don't, if you can't answer yes, we probably should just pass. Yeah. And it's probably better for everybody for us to pass and say, I'm really sorry, it's not for us. And loving it doesn't mean you love everything about it and there's no risk. There's no like, I do love it, but I'm concerned about X, Y, Z. That's a totally fine answer. But the, I'm just not sure. I don't see very often you go from the, I'm just not sure to the, yes, I absolutely love it. Generally, it wanes rather than, accelerates and if it accelerates probably some other VC will have made that decision earlier and you probably miss out I think, uh, so to answer so again to go back to sort of what's your founder look out for like the emails that just say oh yeah great look that's interesting can we meet again in three weeks time or I'm really I'm sorry I'm really being really busy that's probably not going to be a yes good insight definitely look I'm conscious of time but I've just got like two I think two more questions something like that 
have you seen it where founders, because because again, if you've never raised funds before, it can probably be a very prickly kind of environment to go through, right? You it's hard. Just, yeah, hard. You kind of, you don't know what's going on. Um, you've got all these people, you know, give, trying to give you money and it's like, yeah, I'll take it, I'll take it, whatever. What I guess do founders need to look out for when they are offered money from, a, from an investment firm? Yeah, what mistakes should they be, be wary of if they're being offered money when picking a, a partner? So the obvious, really obvious answer that I think a lot of people would give you is it's not all about valuation, right? Which sounds like a perfect answer for a VC to give because clearly founders want the valuation to be super high and VCs want the valuation to be super low because sure. that affects what happens in the future, right? If it goes, instead of saying don't look at value, like valuation isn't the only thing, what I'd say is you're trying to strike a balance that feels fair to everybody. And sometimes you kind of get this, well, we're obsessed over valuation. We want the valuation to be X and we'll give up a load of stuff to allow that to happen. And there's lots of structures in VC that can kind of mean that you might only own a certain percentage of the business because the valuation is high, but actually you own way more of that economically. So at the time when the sale comes or the exit comes, there's a disproportionate amount of capital that goes to the VC. And there's loads of structuring ways of doing that. I think the goal for a founder should be, especially in those early stages, keep everything as simple as it can be. As simple as it can be. Like, you don't want to get into funky structures that mean that you can tell people you raised at a 10 million valuation. Because I, I could do a 10 million valuation, or put a million pounds in at a 10 million valuation, or put a million pounds in at a 5 million valuation, right? And I could structure the first one, million at 10, to m where I would get more of the upside, or the VC would get more of the upside than I do at one million at five. Right. And it's just structuring. So it looks like a 10 million valuation, but really it's more like a five million valuation. Avoid that at all costs. Like funky structuring doesn't help anybody because it just makes it hard down the line. The other thing I'd say, so that's kind of on the what deal should you take? It's about the overall package, not what is the headline number. The second is find people you want to spend time with. It's human nature, right? You're gonna spend quite a bit of time with your VC. If the VC, especially if like if it's like us, where we're actually we're at, we're at very active post investment. That doesn't mean running the company, by the way, but just like we want to help, we want to help the founders build the best business they can. Find people you like spending time with, because. The one thing that probably won't happen or happens in the rare occasion is VC invests and the business goes on an absolute charge and nothing bad ever happens and this is great and we sell in three years time and everyone makes Brewsters and we're like, you know, it's just a great thing, right? That very rarely happens. More likely is there will be challenges. The more likely is that sales that you thought would happen might take a bit longer or you know, some people, you, know, you start hiring people and you find out that actually hiring people is really hard and that having 20 people or having 50 people is way harder than having that, that core of 10 people who bought massively into the business right in the early days. Mm -hmm. And throughout that, you're going to have to have a relationship with your VC, with your funder, right? So find people you actually want to spend time with, who you feel will have a hard conversation with you, but won't hold it against you, mm -hmm. will help you wherever they possibly can rather than berate you for missing budget, right? So to be clear, in setting up Pratura in the 10 years we've done, right, we've missed practically every budget we've ever set ourselves, right? So why would we beat up a founder for missing budget? Like, yes, we all want you to hit budget, and yes, we all hope there's a plan that we can broadly speak to, but it's only later on that you start really being able to budget really, really well. Um, and we've missed our budgets, and actually, We've got two sides of the business and the debt business now is they know exactly what they're doing and they're great at budgeting. But on the journey, we miss budgets, right? So why would we beat people up? But I do know VCs who literally will see that other companies miss budget and start beating them up and telling them what the fuck are they doing? And like, that's just rubbish. It's just a rubbish conversation. Like we, it's almost as if we're thinking the founder wants to miss budget. They don't, they want to hit, they want to sell stuff really quickly. It's about helping, it's about getting in and like, one of the partners at Pratura, Andy, talks about getting the boat and row, right? You know, pick up an oar and start rowing and helping people. So pick up, pick people who you feel will get in the boat and row. Not, 
throw rocks at you from the sidelines because they've now got a report that you've underperformed back into their big corporate engine or whatever it is, right? So just find people who you think will support you. Find people you like spending time with. Find people you want to go and have a conversation with about things other than the business, about life, about you know some of the questions you've asked me today, like who are you as a person, like what what's really, what motivates you, like some of some of the people I spend enjoy spending time with the most right now are founders within our portfolio. Not every not every founder, but some of them get on really really well with them. Love to go for a beer with them. Love to, and not talk about, not just to find out how you're doing, but just talking about life, the universe, everything. Fantastic answer. Once again, I love, I love that or grabbing an or analogy is is so so powerful and all throwing rocks from the sidelines is is there a duty of care from a, as a as a vc yes yeah 100 percent. yeah do and i like, think do i think that all vcs pay attention to it no no i think vcs vcs don't have a great reputation right like as an industry i'm a recruiter david yeah i, yeah. I get what you mean you understand <laughs> yeah. right? so you understand uh probably politicians up there as well right? uh <laughs> We don't, have an, we don't have a great reputation. I think it's because people in VC, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's power law, right? And power law basically means most of your returns are gonna come from the top 10% of your, of your exits. So if you back 10 companies, a lot of your returns are gonna come from the one that goes on to be an absolute superstar. And that's well-known maths and logic within the VC world, right? But the problem is people have taken to it absolute extreme and gone, right, well, if we've worked out which one of the 10 we, is going to be the thing, right, fuck the rest. That's not right. Because this is of someone's dream. This is someone's business. This is people employed. This, is, this affects way more than just, like, what our fund return is. This affects stuff. You know, within our business now, we've probably got, Within the portfolio, probably 2,000 people are employed by businesses within virtual portfolio. And that's not including the people we lend money to on the lending side of business. That's just Pratura Ventures business, okay, portfolio companies, 2,000 people. What responsibility? Yeah, and you, like, yeah. And we're not the answer to everything, and we're not the only funder, and we're not the only people in, in them, and yeah, we've got partnerships with other funders, and, and some of them don't need funding. But that's a lot of people. I think one thing that you know that I do think VC do really badly, and there's lots in the paper right now about layoffs, right? The year of layoffs, and Google have just laid off twelve thousand people, which sounds like a fucking huge amount of people. And the problem is, as a VC, you're a little bit removed from that. And I've seen it. I've been on boards where people are talking layoffs, and you know the VC is like, right, you need to cut twenty percent of the people because you've not worked whatever. And then they get in the spreadsheet out and they don't know the fucking names on the spreadsheet, right? And they go, well, should we, what about this person? Should we, like, this isn't the way to do it, right? This isn't a spreadsheet thing. We might agree strategically that we need to cut the workforce because we haven't got the money because we need to, like, survival is better than going out in a blaze of glory, right? <laughs> so sometimes it's necessary, but there is a way of doing that in an empathetic way. And there is a way of allowing the founder to do that in a way that makes sense to them. It's not for me to say, right, George and Emily and Tristan, they need to go, despite me knowing nothing other than they're a name on a spreadsheet. Sure. That's just a terrible way of doing it. But because people are removed from it, and I think this is one of the things that I do like about Pratura as a VC, is we've, we've, we've come up, we've founded a number of businesses, not just a VC. We've been through challenges. We've had to, you know, COVID was difficult. We had to make some changes within the business, right? And you realize just how shit that is. Like how absurdly shit it is to make something redundant. Or to say during COVID, as we did there with, with some people, like we're gonna need to make, you know, a temporary pay cut, you know, because otherwise we're gonna have to get rid of people as we did in ventures. And when you realize how absurdly shit that is, I think it gives you much more empathy for founders who are going to have to make those decisions. Mm. Whereas I think if you've never, if you've never quite been a founder, if you're not a founder-led organization, if you've never been through that, right? This is a spreadsheet exercise with no, like you, you forget that that is a name that's on the spreadsheet, but that is a person who might have a mortgage, who might have 
a family situation that might not have a nest egg saved up and like you're just going well they need to go that's shit and we do have a duty of care for that that is not to say that that isn't the right decision but let's all at least ex accept that that is a fucking hard decision and something that we all need to be empathetic about and actually if we can make that as soft a landing as possible for those individuals let's do that if we can do that because the the you know the 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 few extra grand the five grand whatever that you pay to that person means a lot more to them than it does to a vc that deals in investing millions it just does and we need to be careful with that and I, you know, and I do have to be really careful with what I say here because I don't want anyone to think that you know we're in this world of giving up, like being too soft or any of that sort of stuff. But there is an empathetic part of it. Yeah, and I think I don't think it came across that way either. I think it came across in the way that <clears throat> you're aware of the, um, the the struggles that a founder needs to go through just to make the really hard. business work. Yeah, but launching a launching a company, building a company is really really hard. You spend most of your time not knowing what you're doing. I, I you're yeah, great story I often tell with like Prochura, we set up an operational partner program, which is a bunch of people who've worked with us because they've been there, seen it and done it before and can help farmers build the best business they can. And we're, we're so lucky we brought in some amazing people to do it. Um, the reason it came about is because COVID hit 2020, sort of, yeah, 2020, the year slapped everyone in the face, right? <laughs> I just went, what the fuck has happened here? I'm sat in my office at home talking to everyone on Zoom or Teams. And I was like, yeah, this is really hard. Yeah, really hard. And you, get, you the worst thing goes through your head, like we're never going to raise any more money. Every business we've backed is going to go bust. The lending money, the lending business that we've got has lent money to SMEs. It won't pay us back. And 10 years of work, poof, gone, right? Yeah, that's, that is the very quick version of what I thought in April 2020. And I started speaking to Steve Corns, who I mentioned before, um, he was at Phones for You and then he was CEO and CFO at AO. Went through the whole thing from like 7 million of revenue to 1.5 billion of revenue at AO, right? So just enormous growth. And he was an investor in our fund and I got to talk to him. I can't remember why I got talking to him. I'm just sitting up on the phone. And that became like a, an ad hoc conversation, became a weekly conversation, became like formal mentoring, became like, so Steve ended up by the end of the year was chairman of Prochura Ventures, invested in Prochura Group, it became a mentor to me. And I kind of realized in, I'd learned more about running a business from nine months working with Steve than I had in nine years of just like, get up, do what you think is the right thing to do that day and hope that you've made some right decisions. So he had a framework for me, had a way of like explaining like what, you, what you're trying to achieve here, you know, of, you know, he calmed me down from like, you know, during COVID, I was like, we can do this, we can do that. We can like, so I was just trying to find any way of like getting through. He's like, no, no, we're, we're this. You're a VC, be the best VC you can, right? Decide what you're gonna be and then his words are be, decide what you're gonna be and then be it like hell, right? So it was just like, do that. Don't, don't go over here and do this. He talked about, he taught me about like being defined by what you don't do as much as what you do do. That was the entire sort of, that experience was what led me to like operational partners within the business to we're trying to provide that level of support to founders who are in our portfolio. And I think what that made me realize is it's okay to not know. I probably spent a lot of time trying to convince everybody that I knew what I was doing. And I didn't, and it's okay. <laughs> like I just didn't. And I think that's really, like, I think probably that's like one of those things where you just like, you have that moment, you're just like, fuck's sake, yeah, I didn't know. And I've been trying to pretend I did. And I think founders, it might not be your VC. If it's a founder in Prochura, I hope it is, but it might not be. Founders should really spend time looking at who is it around them that can help them with that. Been there, seen it, done it, got the t-shirt, can talk to them really about like how life is can help them with the thing, can be a sounding board for, I'm thinking of doing this, is that a fucking mad idea? Which I did a lot with Steve, but I'm thinking of doing this, is that fucking crazy? And he'd be like, yes, you're nuts, stop it. Be, be a VC, the world will come back, you'll raise money, the businesses will, businesses will perform and you'll be okay. But like, 
I needed someone, to, I needed that mirror. Mm. I needed someone to hold up to me. And like, if you like, if anyone sort of sees me now or hears me on any podcast or, or talks about LinkedIn, like I'm just a huge advocate of mentors, like a huge advocate of finding people who care about you, who care about what you're trying to do, but who can have that honest conversation of, you fucking nuts, yeah. don't do that. Or this is gonna be really hard. Have you considered doing it this way? Mm. Massive, massive advocate. And if Pratura can be that for some of our, well, I'd like it to be for every founder in our portfolio, but that's probably unrealistic because people will have their own mentors and they'll come into it. But if we can be that for a good proportion of our founders, that's fucking awesome. Conscious time, I've got one last question. Yeah. It's only a quick one, so don't worry. Um, <clears throat> Today's your last day on earth. It's not, by the way. Uh, is oh, it? That was the <laughs> that, that's, that's a bombshell, right? Um, Bad and, news. Yeah, I know. <laughs> podcast ruiner. Um, the, imagine today was your last day on earth. And apart from being on this amazing podcast, obviously, and spending time with family and uh, and all that sort of thing, what would you be up to? What would you be doing? I'd be at home with my missus and yeah. my dog. And, I'm, and I, would have, I would have... There would not be a single fucking thing that I would do other than that. Like, that bit. I'm like really... Uh, family's like family's very important to me um, my, my wife is amazing um, we went through hell to be here like she's from America we met in Vegas uh, during COVID she got locked down over here so we were doing the long distance thing sure. um, so we were I was commuting from Manchester to New York to see her before COVID before you could right she came over, got locked down here. She's been over here now for three years. During lockdown, we applied for her to become to be able to stay here permanently. After six months, she got rejected on a technicality. And after six months of hearing nothing, we got two weeks for her to leave the country. Um, so we thought, fuck that. Flew to Vegas, got married. Uh, very, like, we went to Vegas because this is where we met, but it was also the easiest place to get married in a day. <laughs> so got married in Little Chapel just off Vegas and then applied for her to become come and be allowed to stay as a spouse uh, and the lawyer said to us well to be really super careful on this don't live in the country so we did that then we sp so we got married two days after we got married we split up and she went to Scottsdale to stay with some friends and I came home and then for the period of time whilst we were getting the spouse visa uh, 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 approved we lived in Portugal for a bit, which meant I commuted to Manchester from Portugal. She's just fucking awesome. And we've got a house and we've got a dog and we've like, you know, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, if this, if this is my last day of earth, like I'm fucking off and I'm just going to spend the year. And it's, that's what I want it. Go and walk the dogs in the fields and just be, live way more important than anything else that we do. Love that. Great answer. Well, look, it's been amazing speaking to you. Genuinely, I think we could have done this for two or three hours, but I can, um, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the camera life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been amazing speaking to you. Some really amazing insights, I think, for people that are going through that investment journey and Pratura, or however you pronounce it, however you want to pronounce Pratura, it. Pratura, Pratura, I don't know. All of them. However you, however you want it. <laughs> One of them. I'm really excited to, to see what's, you know, what's going on in 12 months time. So cool. yeah, thanks. Great stuff. And that's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for listening. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Anything we talked about will be linked in the show notes. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we'll catch you on the next one.